Welcome to Shooting Straight with Brad and David. I'm David Klaus, your Navajo County Sheriff, and my partner. I'm Brad Carlin, the Navajo County Attorney. This month we're joined with Jason Cash. Jason is the Chief Probation Officer for Navajo County, and welcome to the show, and thanks to you for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, thanks. Jason. So Jason, what are some of the biggest challenges you face in probation that makes your job difficult? Um, well, I mean, probation, uh, Probation's goal is to protect the community, number one. Um, and we do that by trying to help uh, people who have offended, um, help them change their lives, kind of overcome some of those problems that make them more high risk uh, offenders um, so that they can avoid making some of the same mistakes uh, in the future. So I would say our biggest challenge um, that we have when we're dealing with a, an offender, uh, what we're looking at was we're looking at their risk level. Um, and then what they're what we call them criminogenic risk criminogenic needs um, and then we're also looking at once we know what those risks and needs are you know what interventions do we need to take in order to help them overcome those high criminogenic needs that they have so do these risk assessments look for substance abuse issues mental health issues things of that nature yes those are two uh two of the factors, criminogenic risk factors that they look at. Because I know for Sheriff Klaus and I, we see a lot of substance abuse and mental health issues in the people that he arrests, those I prosecute and then eventually give to you. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing those same type of issues. Yeah, we see those same issues over and over. Probably uh, at least 90% of our uh, people who are on probation uh, have at least some history of substance abuse or mental health. 90%? Uh, yeah, roughly. So what resources do you have to help them with those issues? Uh, and that's kind of going back to your questions, one of our biggest struggles is uh, those resources. Uh, unfortunately, we're you know, a small rural area and we just don't have a whole lot of uh, behavioral health resources that we need to handle the amount of services we need for it. And when we're talking about our clientele, we have uh, uh, quite a few probationers that have a lot of serious uh, needs when it comes to substance abuse and mental health treatment options that they need. So say I'm, I'm somebody who has done a, a burglary in the community, I, I, David arrests me, I convict me, and, and, and you get me, and you see that I'm addicted to meth. I also drink a quite a bit, and, and I have some depression issues that may lead to some of my substance abuse. What do you do with them? Um, currently, we uh, refer out to what treatments we have uh, locally, if, but usually those aren't adequate enough to address the level of uh, criminal attitudes, uh, criminal behaviors, some of those more antisocial uh, cognitive um, thinking errors that, that they have. Um, so, so is this leading to that re revolving door we hear in the criminal justice system because we're not able to get them all the help that they need to address these underlying issues? They continue to reoffend, violate probation, and revolve in locally until we send them to prison? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, if you don't have the proper interventions um, and if somebody doesn't have the access to the proper uh, cutting edge uh, treatment, Options. Is it even cutting edge or just basic treatment that we don't have available, or if we do have available, not enough resources for the, the need that we have? Both. We don't have enough resources of just the basic uh, treatment to handle the need that we have. Um, but there's also, you know, a lot of, you know, new research coming out uh, that shows us how to lower criminogenic risk. Um, but we don't have any providers that, that practice those things here on the mountain. When you, uh, one more thing, when you say criminogenic risk, <laughs> okay, what do you mean by that? Uh, well, I think we understand, but I'm not even sure I 100% understand. So in probation, one of our, you know, we always try to use evidence-based practices um, to address these issues. And one of the, the main evidence-based practices that we talk about is that we, we follow the R&R &R principle, which is risk needs responsivity. Uh, so when we talk about criminogenic risks, we look, that's, you know, we kind of talk about who to target. So that's somebody, we, we have a offender that comes from you to us, uh, we do an assessment and we assign them a criminogenic risk. You know, how high of a level are they, uh, how, how, how concerned are we that they will reoffend without proper supervision and interventions. Um, then we talk about criminogenic needs, which is, you know, what do we need to target? You know, those are, that's substance abuse, uh, mental health, 
uh, any social attitudes, uh, negative peer influences, distrust of authority, those are all criminogenic needs. Those are uh, drivers that are, that are moving that risk level up. And then the final, the final R, the second R is responsivity. So that is how to target. You know, what level of intervention and what types of interventions do we need to take in order to lower that criminogenic risk? Um, and that's where we're lacking. Uh, that we, we, we do a great job uh, with the risk and the needs. Uh, we have a great tool, um, and, but it's the responsivity. Um, we know what we need, interventions we need to take. We just don't have them available. We don't have the resources. Right. So it sounds like, you know, Brad pointed out the, the cycle. Right. So if, if they're convicted and they're turned over to probation and you just checked on them, monthly or every few months, mm -hmm. you, you're feeling that there's a high likelihood if they have some of those uh, mental health addiction problems, they're going to reoffend. So what is it that you need to uh, help support those, those three R's to reduce that? Right. We, we need, like I said, we need to work on that responsivity. We need to have those interventions. We need more behavioral health providers that are trained to focus on high criminogenic uh, high-risk uh, offenders. You know, in general economic concepts, usually if there's a need, something fills that need. Mm -hmm. How come we're not getting it filled here? I, I, don't, I don't know. I yeah. got <laughs> because the county right. government is good to pay. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, there's, you know, you know and it, it's all covered by uh, Medicaid, uh, private insurance if they have that. Uh, so, I mean, there's there's a need here. There's, there's, uh, but it's. I th it seems like there's a high turnover mm -hmm. in, in the local counseling fields. And are, are there some type of treatment counselors that there's totally a void of? I, I know from my work, sex offenders in particular, right. there's really nothing locally to help them. Yeah, currently we don't have any, any uh, certified. Uh, uh, sex offender people anybody who specializes in sex offender counseling um, we have to uh, we have I think there's one in Winslow but I mean that just covers just the tip of the iceberg of what we need and we got 10,000 square miles of the county right and oh. how many people do you have on uh, adult probation currently we, we always have around um, about 750 direct cases is a pretty good average and it fluctuates goes up and down you and your team supervise monitor yeah yes so, so those are all in county living in Navajo County and then we have a, usually about another 250 to 300 that live outside of the county or out of state and how many of those do you think are in need of this uh, behavioral health treatment and uh, additional resources that we currently don't have available Roughly, uh, we have approximately about 500 that are either medium high or high risk. Um, so, and you can, you can safely assume that all 500 of those need significant level of uh, counseling. And that's just the felons. Yeah. We have even a larger mm -hmm. pool of misdemeanors that we're not treating that tend to graduate and then end up in our felony pool. Yeah, correct. So we're not doing that early intervention or able to do diversionary programs at that level to try to get them that initial treatment. So what solutions do you see available to us? Well, one solution is, uh, is you know you know I've, I've been looking at this for the past couple of years and we've already started this process is to do it ourselves start hiring our own in-house uh, counselors training them um, to specifically work with this population uh, and specifically try to drive down that criminogenic you risk. said you started this process what have you started doing so we we opened up our our hub center for success which is our youth uh, center. It's an alternative detention. We take our high-risk uh, youth and rather than send them to detention, they go to school there and then they have life skills and enrichment activities. Um, so we hired, recently hired a, a, a clinician, at LCSW, so a fully licensed master's level clinician um, to work in the hub um, to start providing those, uh, those services to the juveniles, kind of starting on a small scale. Why did you pick juveniles over adults? Uh, it's easier getting funding. To <laughs> okay, that's a good reason. <laughs> right, to start it. Well, um, it's pretty nice, uh, you know, the facilities you have there. Mm -hmm. I've done a couple tours there, or, you know, you've given me, and you have a lot of options for these kids with music and 
You said life skills, cooking, and yeah, yeah. life skills are important. Yeah, it's it's a nice facility. They're, they, uh, I think they're, you know, when we first get a, a new juvenile there, they at first are kind of a little resistant, resistance, and then they they start seeing the stuff there and the things we do, and they they buy in pretty quick. So, how long have you had the the counselor or clinician there at the hub? Uh, for approximately a month now. So um, it's really too early to see what's. Too early. He's just really now starting to uh, start provide services. Uh, the first month was a lot of training, a lot of new certifications. Um, you guys said that there was approximately 500 on any given day uh, adult, probationers adult probationers that really need the services we've been talking about. How about the juvenile population? So the juvenile population is um, you know, much smaller, obviously. It's a smaller age group. Um, so we usually have a, around 100 juvenile. Uh, juveniles on probation at any given time uh, and you can assume at least 50 to 60 percent or medium high or high risk and that you have all those 50 participating in, in no we not not all 50 uh, we, we we don't have the resources have otherwise the resources. We, would. I, we would yeah we'd love yeah. to uh, so yeah unfortunately you know and it's the same with the adult we have the drug court program to, to you know work with the really high risk but you know all of our services, both adult and juvenile, really cover about 10% of the population that really needs it. So you've started with this one counselor in the hub with your high, high-risk juveniles. What is your vision going forward with all of this? Uh, my vision going forward is uh, we're hoping to make it sustainable by actually becoming an access provider uh, so that we can actually build access. Um, and I would like to expand, you know, a lot of what we're doing in the juvenile world and expand it to the, the adult world, too, because they, they need the same types of services. Um, hire more counselors. Um, and I would like to, you know, I, I would like to eventually start helping out, you know, with the services in the jail. Because, uh, I mean, it affects probation, too. And we, we send a lot of people back into the jail. Um, so, so, David, why aren't you providing these services in the jail? Well, you, you just not limited, yeah. I understand, but, yeah. but, but what can you do and, and why can't you do more there? Again, and it comes back to qualified people in the area, too, is funding. Um, we have the population, we have the people that are in need, we have... Um, You're the biggest pro mental health ward, or hospital, in the county. Yeah, if you look at the studies, I mean, the National Sheriff's Association, the Arizona Sheriff's Association have all recognized and we, and myself here in Navajo County, recognize that our jail population um, across the country, roughly 20% have always been found where it's very high risk and that they have a serious mental health issue and that they are incarcerated um, on a mental health problem that most likely if they had received treatment, they wouldn't be incarcerated. And a lot of people don't realize that once somebody enters that jail door, they get kicked off access. Yes. Oftentimes their private pay doesn't do it, and it all becomes a county cost. Yeah. And also we have trouble, or you should have trouble in the jail, getting their mental health records because of HIPAA, it takes time. So these people who are on medications further deteriorate because you don't know what to provide them. And that's absolutely true. Our largest cost in running the jail is medical, and our largest part of the medical is these um, provide or trying to fight, provide this treatment, and then the delays, and then it delays your office too. And we're trying to um, get them. So, so if, if Jason's vision comes into play, and Navajo County develops its own behavioral health department, in essence, how do you think that would uh, impact the jail? So I look at Jason when we talk about 500, and I say, how many of those reoffend? And when they reoffend, they they're investigated either by the sheriff's office or a local police department. Then they're booked into the jail, and so we'd see a reduction in bookings. We'd see a reduction in our jail population, but these are a high-risk jail population. This isn't our low risk, just like you were talking about. These are the ones that take several deputies or officers uh, to deal with. Plus, we're not trained and we're not mental health experts. And so then there's a lot of um, issues and concerns that brings up that way. So if we reduced our population, say, 10% or even 20% with these types of numbers, with our highest risk, it obviously lowers cost for us, less cases referred 
uh, again to your office and talk about that cycle mm -hmm. that you mentioned at the beginning. And I think that we see that, especially in a small county like Navajo County, where you see a lot of the same, you know, potentially 200, <coughs> 300 names that are, that are repeat offenders. And I, this is the example I give all the time. I don't know how many uh, disturbance calls, domestic violence we re respond to. And, and as you're filling out information or you're getting a statement from victims or witnesses, they say, well, ever since you know, so-and-so stopped taking their medication, or ever since you know, there's a little trigger point and then it's caused this event. And it's like mm -hmm. that then at the time as a young deputy, you don't, you're just thinking that. But now when you're trying to look at the picture at a whole, you say, how are we gonna reduce the the recidivism in Navajo County, you're like, that's the target right there. Right. Those are the ones we need to be targeting. No, no, Sheriff Klaus and myself have jumped on your vision and kind of got you to help expand your vision a right. little bit. Because besides in the jail, I see it as we can do an earlier intervention before they even get to you by doing diversion programs. Sure. If we have it in-house, when the case comes to me, I can see that it's more substance abuse, mental health. They're not truly criminals at heart, and I can send them off to that treatment. Right. I can have them go to a substance yep. abuse, address some of these criminal criminalistic issues too, so we just don't have sober criminals down the line. And obviously we can divert to pre-arrest. Pre-arrest. Yeah. If there's a, some sort of um, where there's no victim involved or say they commit a, a minor misdemeanor act that were an arrest or anything doesn't is not warranted then we can divert there but say they commit an act of domestic violence where we were by law we have to then brad now has an option of diversion so i think all three of us and we also know from the studies and from our own experiences that it usually takes more than once yeah. <laughs> for somebody to really get it and really succeed. So we can give them that first chance on the law enforcement diversion, a second chance on the county attorney diversion, a third chance on a probation treatment. And then even those that have tr pr troubles on probation, we can put them in those higher risk programs such as drug, drug court. We can create a mental health court, our veterans court, before we let them just revolve into the prison system. And if we can cut down 10% at year point, 10 to 15 at mine, 25 at years, all of a sudden the number of people going to prison's down, the number of people in your jail is down, the prosecutions I have to do is down. Because as you said, they cycle back and back. Yeah, right. So my 1,100 or more felony cases a year, there are a lot of repeat names in that. Mm -hmm. Well, we then it's harder. That. Then you, you, I think from the prosecution point, you probably look at, I'm giving less and less options every time they come, but to send them to prison. Prison, right. And, um, Where they get no treatment either, yeah. for the most part. I know we're trying to change that the legislature, but we need more. And the other good aspect of this is, is we're putting sober people who are good citizens back in the community. So we're reducing those who are on uh, assistance from the government because they'll be able to have a job. And I know that we've talked about this program is just not the treatment, but more of a holistic approach right. to it. Uh, you know, so who are some of the partners, Jason, that you're looking to bring into this program to make these productive citizens again? Um, yeah, so I mean, it's not only substance abuse. When we talk about criminogenic needs, again, going back to that, uh, it's not only substance abuse, mental health, uh, criminal thinking, it's also things like uh, education, employment, um, housing. So those are all criminogenic needs as well. So how, how are you addressing education? So education, we, well, for one, we have our own juvenile high school for our high-risk juveniles now at the hub. Um, but we, for the adults that have it, that never got their high school degree. We work with NPC. We re will often refer them to go uh, do their GED classes. Um, we are th have been talking with Arizona at Work. Uh, that's another partner of ours about what, doing. What is Arizona at Work? Uh, it's it's the workforce development okay. program. It's a federal program. It's uh, administered by the county, um, but they'll pay for. Uh, for job training, uh, for people who qualify for the program, uh, job training equipment that they may need. Mm, there's some apprentice programs the apprentice there. Apprentice programs, they do welding, nursing, a lot of nursing. Uh, and even so. other businesses can participate and get subsidies for these employees to bring them in. Right, um, so 
that's another partner trying to get them those job skills, get the education. Uh, we've talked to, talked with them about uh, during the day when the kids are at high school, we have a whole computer bank in the hub, maybe bringing in adults in to work on their GED, uh, you know, when the kids are over on the yeah. other side of the building. Um, yeah, I, I know that, and I've, I've dealt with these people in my nearly 30 year legal career, some of them don't even know how to fill out a job application. No. Is there a way to help them with that? Uh, yeah, Arizona Work provides, I mean, probation officers, that's kind of their job too. They'll help uh, do those things. Uh, but there are, you know, Arizona at Work does do uh, resume writing classes, uh, how to fill out a job application, uh, a lot of things. And, and we've partnered with other community organizations, like I know in, in drug court, mm -hmm. the church has been very active yeah, in yes, providing yeah. services and, and hitting those areas that we can't find other governmental assistance. And, and are you looking f for other community partners to come in and help with this holistic approach? Oh yeah, um, yeah, the faith-based community is a big partner. Um, yeah, any, you know, it's, it's, it's a community problem. What, what we're trying to do here is protect the community, trying to rebuild a, a portion of our community so that they become a successful, productive. So, it, I mean, it takes a yeah. community approach. It's not, it's it's not like something any one agency or organization can And the government doesn't have do. all the answers. Well, no, it no. needs to be all of us. Right. Do you have employers that, that, or that work with you or job placement programs th through probation or? Nothing through probation. Uh, I know it's been a while since I've been in the field, uh, yeah. but I know there, there are different employers that are See, more friendly to yeah. hiring. Uh, I, I know everybody's always looking for, I mean, the economy's doing well and everybody mm -hmm. seems to be hiring. And right. I know we're always looking for qualified <laughs> individuals. Right. Um, and so I, I think there's, there's a good need there is if we get these people education, get them job placement or job skills, mm -hmm. more likely not to reoffend when you're busy staying at work. From my perspective as the chief prosecutor in the county, I see the substance abuse, mental health as the biggest issue. Mm -hmm. The second one I see is the housing issue. Mm -hmm. Do you see that from the, the probation issue side too? Oh, oh definitely, yeah. Uh, it's a lack to, of access to quality housing. Because uh, I know I don't want some of these, especially substance abusers, to go back in the houses where the other people still have substance abuse issues. Mm -hmm. so, so how broad is this housing available now and how big of a gap is there? It's one of the biggest gaps we have. Uh, I mean, it's obviously it's housing, so it's, it's very expensive to provide somebody housing, so you always have those funding problems. Um, and there's just, uh, there's a couple of organizations that do great work, but it's just a drop in the bucket. Again, they're serving maybe five, 10% of the, of the need, so. And uh, do we have any ideas how to address this issue? Or is that just the, the next big battle that we're gonna have to figure out how to attack? Yeah, yeah, I think it's just the next, I mean, I don't have the answer to that, I wish I did. Um, but you know, We hear about great um, resources, you could call them resources, or private donors, um, large organizations that provide this in the Valley, mm -hmm. or in the Phoenix, large metropolitan areas. And so there's models out there, but it's always trying to get... And we always have the issue of not in my backyard, too. And yes, right. yes, and I think that we're s such small towns that w where, you know, where, does, mm -hmm. where do we place it? One of the other problems that I see that I'm hoping your plan is going to ad address is residential treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, because I know from my participation in drug court for males, we usually wait for Salvation Army to open a bed. Females is tough. Right. I know at one time we had a residential treatment in the jail, but our funding dried up. David, do you think we'll be able to bring back the, some type of residential treatment through the sheriff's department in the jail? I know you have some room outside the jail facility for something like yeah, this. Yeah, we have an old pod that, that's outside. Um, used to kind of be an overflow for a female pod. Um, we've looked in, you know, there's, I think that's something we've all discussed and saying, we can again start small, mm -hmm. and I think that's a facility that can house, you know, potentially 20, and um, 
and there won't be waits because we're wait months now yeah. months to yeah. get people in residential treatment. But again, twenty less files to your office to your office and, and twenty call. less people who are deteriorating because we're mm -hmm. not getting them the treatment that they need. Yeah, and uh, unfortunately our. Time's pretty much up, Jason. I'll, I'll let you close, David. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us, and we appreciate the, the conversation here. I think we all working together. We've uh, all I'm recognized the issues. And I'm excited. Yeah. I, I, I know that we're trying to get funding from the legislature, and, and Representative Blackman's helping us. I know our board of supervisors has uh, agreed to assist us in developing the business plan. I think it's a great idea, and I know from some of the meetings we've had that others throughout the state, the administrative office, of courts, yes. they're excited because this could be a model that could be replicated in every county. So Jason, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's all the time we have for this month's Shooting Straight. Stay tuned for our Most Wanted. The Navajo County Sheriff's Office is seeking Richard Albert Holmes, a white male, six foot one, that weighs 200 pounds, with brown eyes and red hair. He is wanted for failure to appear and felony sale of dangerous drugs. If you have any information of the whereabouts of Richard Albert Holmes, please contact the Navajo County Sheriff's Office at 928-524-4050 or anonymously at 1-800-78-CRIME or wetip.com.